You know, as I get into these cases, as I go deeper and deeper down the innocence fraud rabbit hole, I end up coming up with similar people backing the wrong party in each and every one of these cases. But that's not the only pattern that I notice. I've also noticed that disproportionately, if you can put forward a narrative of racism, your chances of getting more attention for these cases are also significantly higher. But again, that is not the only pattern that I notice. The other thing that I notice is the fact that the bloody fingerprints of the true crime community are all over almost every single case that I cover. Now, the Adnan Saeed case that we talked about in many videos before is notorious for the mishandling and bungling in the presentation in the media or lack of bungling considering that these people were always advocating for the guilty Adnan to get out and that was the point of a bunch of those media projects. Now, while it would be easy for me to just blame a blanket, the true crime community and say, honestly, they are creating these problems, in reality, that doesn't address the fundamental question, which is, why do people love true crime so much? Why is this one of the top genres, not only in online alternative media, but in mainstream media? And what I think that people love about the true crime movement or true crime stories is the fact that they're stories, but they're stories about people that you could actually be. The Lord of the Rings isn't really about you, even though the characters could be somebody that you could do a self-insert for in order to experience the narrative on an emotional level. But somebody who got killed over an affair after their mundane job or something went south could easily be you or somebody that you know. Much in the same way that horror movies are us experiencing terror in a controlled environment, the true crime community and true crime stories are a way for us to live vicariously through others, insert ourselves in the place of the characters, and see how our mundane lives can turn into a mystery of national or even international renown. But the thing is, is that the stories are all down to the quality of the storyteller, because a lot of these cases are not interesting. A lot of these cases don't really give the intrigue, the mystery that a Sherlock's home tale or some other kind of week to week detective show will give. So what happens? The storytellers end up adding that mystery and non-ambiguous cases get skewed, get colored, get changed, get altered, details are left out as if it is a narrative because what happens when a story goes from the facts in the court to the court of public opinion is oftentimes that's exactly what it becomes. Now, what we're going to do today is go over one of these tales. We're going to talk about a case that isn't even close. We're going to talk about a case that is clearly and obviously a non-mystery, yet there is mystery, there is intrigue added into it, all for your entertainment. But before we get into that, we have bills to pay, so I'm going to toss it to the sponsor, then I'll bring it back over here, then I'll bring the whole thing home, and we'll talk about it on the other side. Apple and a lot of big tech companies have a long history of placing restrictions on what we all agree should be protected speech, and you can see this not only in the way that they bully companies that don't agree out of the App Store, but we found out recently that they actually restrict your ability to access certain websites depending on where you are and depending on what that website promotes. This is one of the reasons reasons why I recommend getting a VPN and the absolute best one can be found over at virtualshield.com slash justice. The strict no log VPN is free for you to try for 30 days. Their features include the ability to change your VPN's location so you can get around content locks and for my audience on top of the 30 day free trial there is a 73% promo that you can keep with you for the length of your subscription. Again 73% off for life if you sign up over at virtualshield.com slash justice virtualshield.com slash justice. So the murder of Krista Worthington is absolutely perfect for what we're going to talk about today because in 2002, this woman, after Christmas, was found dead in her home with her infant daughter grabbing onto her arms. And she was dead for about 36 hours, so had people not showed up to check on her in time, the baby likely would have passed away as well. And what we found out throughout the course of the investigation of this case is that the baby's father was actually an official in charge of shellfish in the region in this Cape Cod area. Now, this was a small town, a small wealthy town, 800 people. It had a small town police department that was inexperienced in investigating homicides because they hadn't dealt with one in over 40 years in this area. So you also had a pretty girl 
rich, inheritance on the line, an affair with a local official, combined with an inexperienced police force, and there's money involved. So this was the perfect setting for the media to latch on to this case, and they absolutely did. Now, police under pressure, and due to the fact that they did not have a lot of experience, decided to go with the very unusual method of doing a DNA dragnet of all the men in the town in order to figure out who was responsible for some biological material that was left at the scene of the crime. You see, Krista Worthington, it actually was discovered, had semen in her body because she was likely raped and then murdered, and then her body was discovered one and a half days later by the authorities. So they decided to do a very unusual thing. Investigators took the controversial step of launching what's called a DNA dragnet. They asked all of Truro's roughly 800 male residents to voluntarily give DNA samples. Now, this was a big story right off the bat. And in fact, The New Yorker actually wrote up a lengthy piece called The Single Mom Murder that is still available to be read to this day. It will be linked in the description if you want to get an idea of about how salacious this story is. Again, it had everything that the media would want. 46-year-old Krista Worthington, an accomplished fashion writer, was found murdered Sunday in her Truro home. She was stabbed through the chest. Her two and a half year old daughter Ava was found unharmed near the body. There's some evidence that she had taken her sippy cup and tried to like, feed her mother and she's trying to wake her mother up. The Cape had never seen or witnessed an event like this ever. The Worthington family goes back generations here in Truro where they are rich in property. Krista inherited her mother's weather-worn cottage. Her father was a Harvard-educated lawyer and it was a very privileged upbringing. After high school Krista went to Vassar. She actually was the bureau chief in Paris for Women's Wear Daily. She wrote for all the major magazines, Cosmo, Harper's Bazaar. There was nothing to indicate who it might have been. And more importantly, it was something that went down in a wealthy white person area of town. So it checked all of the boxes. However, the investigation kind of died, which only led to the mystique of the story. But the reason why the investigation died wasn't because it was that complicated a case. It's because the police were not that well experienced and doing a DNA dragnet of every man in an 800 person town is not going to actually produce the same level of results as if you were to, you know, go find suspects, interview those suspects, press those suspects, and actually obtain information. However, three years after the murder, there was actually a break in the case because they still had the DNA on file, and it turns out they re-ran it in the CODIS system, and they discovered the source of the DNA. It was a man called Chris McGowan. Now, I'm going to make this 100% clear. Chris McGowan is the man who murdered Krista Worthington. It is just a fact. It is obvious. It is clear. He was convicted of this. And one of the reasons why you know for sure is that when they initially contacted him and asked him if he knew or had any contact with her, he said, absolutely not. No way. Don't worry about it. I didn't know that lady. But it turns out his semen's inside her. She was raped prior to her murder. So obviously this man did in fact do it. And if you're wondering how this man made his way into this area that was a wealthy area of Cape Cod, Massachusetts without being noticed, well, he kind of was noticed because he was the trash man. He was somebody who worked in the area. And guess what? About the time that they expect this woman to die, she would have been along this guy's route. That's when he would have saw her. She's a single mother living in a house with an infant baby. The house is on an isolated stretch of road. So he could have easily entered the home, raped the mom, then killed her, left her on the floor, and then peaced out of the situation. So this guy did do it. He is the guilty party. Now, what we need to talk about is the fact that Sonny Hostin, somebody from The View, is actually working to free this man, despite the fact that he is unbelievably and obviously guilty. And the reason why she's doing that is because, among many other reasons, he says he did not do it. He says now that even though he denied any connection with this woman, there was actually a consensual relationship. He says now that despite the fact that he's given many alternative statements, including one where he was with a man called Jeremy, Jeremy, and by the way, we need to find out where the quartering was in January of 2002 because he might have been the Jeremy that we're talking about when Jeremy murdered her because they planned to break in and rob the place. So this guy has semi admitted to participating in a felony murder. His semen was found in this woman. 
and he's changed his story multiple different times, and yet Sonny Hostin is trying to free him because, again, we have a story where we can claim it's evil white racism afoot. This is a black guy, and Sonny's going with, uh, it was a secret affair. He didn't know how the white justice system would look upon him having a relationship with her because, as we all know, 2002 is actually 1952, and Massachusetts was definitely one of the strongholds of slavery in the United States of America. Jim Crow was was actually invented in the deep south of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and this is one of the reasons why this guy kept lying repeatedly, including semi-admitting to the crime at one point in time, but don't worry about it because Sonny interviewed him for a 2020 documentary, and she says he's quite believable. And today, serious questions remain about how police handled the case and if they got the right man. And, and Christopher McCowan, he's now been behind bars for over a decade. Yeah. He's had three motions for a new trial denied as well as one appeal, but you spoke to him. Can you tell us about that conversation? I did. I spoke to him. I wanted to see him in prison. They wouldn't allow us to do that. They said it was for his protection, which didn't really make a lot of sense. But I spoke to him and interviewed him for over an hour on the phone. He has always maintained his innocence, Paula, and it was fascinating to me how believable he was, mm -hmm. how forthcoming he was, how honest he was. And um, he said, I had a consensual sexual relationship with mm -hmm. this woman, and I know people don't believe that, but that is what happened. And you think it's important to reopen this case? I think it's very important because we want justice, we want the truth, and if this man has been in prison, wrongfully in prison for 11 years, you know, don't we want to free him? Yeah. Sunny, thanks for all your extraordinary reporting. Now, as you can see, Sunny is very convinced because she had a long conversation with this man, and apparently he was very convincing, and we're going to listen to that conversation so you guys could tell me if you're convinced by his story because I got a news flash for you, I got a bit of a spoiler alert. It is not convincing in any way, shape, or form. It is the most ridiculous, insane, asinine tale you will ever be told. But for some reason, Sonny has jumped on board, likely because it fits her preconceived racial narrative. And if she goes to 2020 and pitches them a crime documentary, and there is no mystery, then guess what? There is no story. There is no intrigue. And why are they going to pay her to participate in this documentary? But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you the key piece of evidence that is often argued for the innocence of Mr. McCowan because you're not going to believe this you're going to think it's ridiculous, but it's repeated time and time again, and that is the issue of crime scene contamination. I don't know if you know this, but the crime scene in this case was actually contaminated. Now, was the semen in this case contaminated? Absolutely not. Was there something about the wounds to the body that were contaminated? Not really. What was the major contamination in this crime scene that supposedly makes this guy's multiple different stories supposedly make sense? They have problems here, because this this crime scene was managed very poorly. The blanket was thrown over the victim. That contaminated the body. You know, we saw it in the piece that the police there had rarely investigated murders and there were questions of possible contamination at the crime scene. Mm -hmm. I want to read you what the DA uh, said to ABC News about possible contamination. He said, obviously, initially responding police and emergency medical technicians have to enter a scene to assess the threat and treat the injured. No crime scene is pristine. This one was better than many. But how problematic is how this situation, how it was handled. Extremely problematic. I mean, if you think about it, a murder had not been investigated in this town for 30 years, and they just didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So when you take a blanket and you throw the blanket over the body, you are contaminating the entire crime scene. So I think there are real problems with this case because of the way it was handled. And the fact that this small town police department who hadn't experienced a homicide in 40 years, 40 years, didn't have a single officer on staff that actually conducted a homicide investigation decided that the grisly scene that was left should be covered up and they threw a blanket over the victim. So, just so you know, whenever you hear about crime scene contamination, what they are talking about is that a blanket was thrown over the victim. So when they try to undercut the fact that this dude 100% has his semen inside this woman, he now says after denying that he knew her that he was in a one-time consensual relationship with her, but Sonny has made it clear that they contaminated the crime scene by throwing the blanket. Just remember, all the evidence that I'm going to give you, the overwhelming facts of this man's guilt should be dismissed, according to Sonny, based on the fact that a blanket was thrown over the body there was a blanket put over her body people didn't want to see her dead body in the state that he left her in therefore therefore his semen evidence can you really classify it as evidence but again i may be poisoning the well too much let's go into his version of events because it's amazing we talked about you going into her home to look at a christmas tree can you tell me about that 
Uh, yeah, because um, the day that the, the day was Thursday, and she she asked me to come inside the house and to look at a Christmas tree, and she asked me about if I could put it in the back of my truck or whatever. And I told her I would have to talk to my boss, and so that's when I went outside and called my boss up on the radio and asked him if I could take the tree. He told me not, if it wasn't too big, I could take it. So I went back in the house and told everything that was there. So the story that Chris McGowan is putting forward, if you guys are a little bit confused about what they're talking about, is this idea that he met Krista after Christmas, which makes sense. She was killed in early January. And he met her under the circumstances of her trying to figure out if sanitation could take the Christmas tree out of her home. So she invited the garbage man in to her living room to look at the Christmas tree. And he looked at it and he said, I got to call my supervisor in order to determine whether or not my truck can carry this tree. And she said, OK, the Christmas decorations were on. But essentially, this gave him the impetus to come back into the home later on. And we're just going to go over how absurd this story really gets when he talks about it a little bit more. And did you take the tree out? Not that day. Not that time. Why not? No. Because, you know, she still has um, decorations on it and everything. Okay. So McGowan gives his pitch. He says, this is why I would have been in the house. This is how I met this woman. But obviously, if he doesn't actually have the tree in the truck, and if it's still in the home, this isn't really a good sell. So he has to say that he was in there to look at the tree, but he wasn't going to take the tree then. And he talked to his supervisor, and his supervisor said he could take the tree if it wasn't too big. Essentially, something that you don't need to call a supervisor over, because if you're being brought in to determine whether or not this tree can fit in your truck and you call your supervisor and he says can it fit in your truck that's that's not really like a good cohesive story but again this is the call that Sonny finds very convincing of his innocence so get a load of how these two people ended up hooking up and then what what happened when you explained to her you know what was going to happen with the tree and that you could take it what happened next well after that conversation and everything um you know, right after that conversation, I'm still looking at the tree, trying to determine the size of the tree and stuff. But then, you know, standing there that close enough in vicinity with her, one thing just led to another. I'm just going to play that again so you can understand what he is trying to sell and what Sonny Hostin somebody at The View, somebody who has the title somehow of senior legal analyst actually buys as a legitimate explanation. You know, right after that conversation, I'm still looking at the tree, trying to determine the size of the tree and stuff, but then, you know, standing there that close enough in vicinity with her, one thing just led to another. So you have a wealthy woman living in isolation in a small town in Cape Cod. She's actually having an affair with a government official who's in charge of shellfish, who is actually the father of her daughter, and the affair may be ongoing. Who really knows? It's not really all that important at this moment. And according to this guy, he was invited into her home to assess the size of a Christmas tree. He assessed the size of the Christmas tree, but then, standing there, one thing led to another, And that's how they ended up having intercourse. You see, one of the huge problems that he has is that his garbage route lines up perfectly with the timeline of the murder. You know why? Because he committed the murder. He did do. He is guilty. I want you guys to all understand that this man is guilty. Also, he decided to leave his semen in this woman. But he has to convince you, in order for you to believe that he's innocent, that they had a consensual encounter... And the consensual encounter was done while her infant was in the home. What do you mean one thing led to another? It's just like it was just a mutual um, mutual thing between two people, I guess. And and we started kissing and we winded up, ended up having... And this is the best that he could come up with. And it's about to get a lot worse. Let me play you what convinced Sonny Hostin. What, uh, where were you when you started kissing? We was in the living room. Once you started kissing, and I know you say that you had sex with her, where did that take place? In the living room? That took, that took place in the living room. This is the ultra convincing story that convinced Sonny Hostin, senior legal analyst at ABC and co-host of The View, 
of this man's innocence. Now, let me give you a little bit more background so you can understand exactly why this story has to be so stupid. So first and foremost, he has to somehow get around the fact that his semen is in this woman. Now, obviously it's there because he raped her, but he can't say he raped her because saying that he raped her and then someone else murdered her is not really going to be a good story. So he has to say it was consensual, but the problem is, is that he raped and murdered her on the floor in the living room of this woman's home. So he doesn't have any idea about the geography of the rest of the home. So this genius in his infinite wisdom is essentially saying that coincidentally, right before this woman was murdered, he was invited into the home to inspect the Christmas tree. And this woman was like, oh my God, this garbage man has so much animal magnetism. I'm so into him that one thing's going to lead to another. And we just had to have it out right there on the floor, right where coincidentally, again, she found herself murdered later on, I guess that same day. Obviously, this is an insane story. Obviously, this doesn't work, but it's the only story he can tell based on the fact that he did do it. Where at in the right living there. room? Right there on the floor, right there in the living room. In front of the Christmas tree or somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Right there in front of the Christmas tree. On the floor or on furniture? On the floor. Huh. Now, this story is bad. This story is terrible. Now, it has to be terrible for a number of reasons, but it's about to get even worse because even if you believe that Krista, this wealthy woman who lives in Cape Cod, who already is seeing somebody in an illicit affair, the person that fathered her young daughter, is somehow into Trash Man, and because of his animal magnetism, they just happen to coincidentally have it out in this spontaneous moment right on the floor. By the way, no protection utilized. That's why his semen is there. You also have to account for the fact that this single mother happened to be doing this while her infant daughter was in the home and not in any kind of baby cage, daycare, playpen area, whatever your parents call it, let me know down in the comments below. And that is a tough pill to swallow. But luckily, Chris McGowan has a solution for it. Well, where was where was her um, daughter at this time? Her daughter wasn't even home at the time. Yeah, the baby was out. She wasn't even there. She was outside doing her own thing, obviously. Now, I'm just kidding. I cut it off right there because it was a little bit absurd. But he says that the kid was somewhere at the grandparents or whatever, not even home. And this is obviously trying to indicate that maybe the baby was somewhere else. And then the baby was brought back. And then at that point, somebody else killed Krista. This is why he's putting this story forward. Again, it's not true. It's absurd. Nobody has come forward to say that they had the baby during the period of time that he's describing. So obviously this story has no basis in reality. But again, he has to account for the total erratic and insane behavior of Crystal Worthington in the story that he's telling because obviously he murdered her. I, guys, I don't know if you understand that. He murdered her. That she, he, is, he is guilty. He, he did do. He did do it. So how many times were you intimate with Krista? Just one time. Just one time? Just one time. So Chris McGowan also has to go with that this only happened one time. It was not an ongoing situation. It was just spontaneous right at the very moment, right before she got killed. And he's honestly just the most unluckiest guy. Did I forget to mention the fact that at one point during the course of the investigation, the inexperienced police officers threw a blanket over the body? Whole scene is contaminated. Therefore, therefore, his story should somehow be believed by Sonny Hostin and people over at 2020 because ABC is apparently full of absolute idiots. Hey, hey Chris, uh, this is Mark. I'm a reporter with ABC. Um, mm -hmm. So you say for sure, unequivocally, you weren't at Christmas on Friday. All right. So let me ask you this. You, you had sex with her on a Thursday, and then she right. ends up dead on a Friday. Can you understand why people think that that's odd? That you must have well, killed I mean, her? I, yeah, there's a lot of speculation on, on the exact timeline when she was killed. 
So the first thing that they do is present him a timeline that separates his sexual encounter that totally sounds believable to Sonny Hostin from the time that she was killed. And he gets this offered up to him on a silver platter and immediately says, there's a lot of speculation on when the murder happened. So they gave him positive framing, but he contradicted the positive framing for some reason. And then when they say, don't you think it makes sense? Don't you understand why people actually suspect you? And he responds in the most ridiculous way. But I do understand where a lot of people think that I might have had something to do with that, but I didn't have nothing to do with that. Yeah, I could kind of understand that, but the thing is, I didn't do it. Oh, well, I've never heard that point. Let's move on from this case. Should we bring up the fact that a blanket was thrown over the body, and that's not the procedure that you want to do, and that contaminated the whole crime scene? Now, I, I remember with, uh, I, I've read or I've heard that with Krista... You didn't really talk to many people about this relationship that you that you had. Why is that? Because she asked me not to say anything because she didn't want people to know about her personal business. And, and I'm the same way. I don't want people in my personal business as well. So, you know, I just respected her wishes by not saying anything. So what you're hearing right now is the setup for why he lied to the police. Because when questioned, as I said earlier about whether or not he knew this woman, he said that he did not know this woman, obviously meaning that he lied to the police because he's now going with the, it was a consensual sexual affair. So he's saying she told him not to, and he didn't want to affect her privacy, and he didn't want his personal business out there, and they were the same in that way, and that's why they connected that one moment through animal magnetism under the Christmas tree, and one thing led to another, and he just happened to bang her in the exact spot that they found her body. Now, you can believe that, sure, whatever, but what I find amazing is that even though he clearly lied to the police, it's obvious, he still maintains that he didn't lie to the police, and honestly, it's the police's fault that they got the impression that he didn't know her in a sexual context. Let me play that portion of the conversation. Now, when you were questioned by the police, you told them you didn't know her, you had never spoken to her, and that your only contact with her was just waving. Why did you lie to the police? No, I didn't lie to the police. I told them that, you know, I knew of her and that we talked about her past and everything, but I didn't tell them about we had sex or anything because I was still on the assumption that I was protecting her and about her wishes and stuff. So, but other than that, I... You have 60 seconds remaining. Let me ask you, though, you, you voluntarily gave your DNA to the police, right? Right. Didn't you realize that perhaps they would find out that you had had sex with her? I didn't have nothing to hide. If they would have asked me if I had any kind of intercourse with her, I would have told them, yeah. Yeah, he actually said that in the interview. He was protecting her, and he just told them that they waved, or he they talked about the trash, nothing serious. But it's the police's fault because they never asked him if he had any kind of intercourse with her. That's why even though they took his DNA to match it to the semen that he left on this woman that he raped and murdered, he was like, nah, I'm not going to say anything because they didn't say, did you have intercourse or any kind of intercourse with this woman? Again, Sonny Hostin is trying to free this person. Okay, now let's fast forward to the third time you met with police. Now, this third time you were interviewed by, for six hours. And when, I get when you were arrested and Correct. they say that you said, no, you didn't want the, the, uh, discussion recorded. Why did you make that decision? I was already, I was already under the influence of Percocets. I was under the influence of cocaine and I was already under the influence of marijuana. So, uh, do you remember meeting with the police that day for six hours? Briefly? Yes. And no, because, uh, at the time when they came to my house to arrest me, it was more of a surprise to me mm. because I was sitting there just, I was sitting there smoking the joint and playing video games. Now, McGowan was interviewed by the police multiple times, two times. One, they drew his DNA, and then he was obviously proven to be the person who left the semen inside this woman. So then they brought him in after an arrest. Now, he said that he didn't want his interview recorded, and he says the reason why is because he was incredibly, insanely high during the course of that interview. But when I got down there to the police station and they asked me a bunch of questions, I'm like... Okay, whatever, you know. I don't, I don't really know what's going on. But go ahead and ask, whatever. Did when you... they asked about the, 
when they asked about the videotape and, and the tape recording, I was just, I was I was still surprised. And I said, no, I don't want to be videotaped or tape recorded because I didn't really understand what was going on. And I've been intoxicated like that. Now, obviously, being drugged out of your mind, not a great plan when you're arrested and subject to a police interrogation. But, of course, we're not dealing with the smartest person, the sharpest tool, whatever you want to say. Well, do you ever remember going to... Uh, Krista's house with Jeremy? No. Do you remember Jeremy going to Krista's house? No. As far as I know, he's never been down there with me or any by himself. Did you ever speak to Jeremy about Krista? No. But this is the interview where he started to shift the blame to Jeremy, who could be Jeremy from the quartering, which makes a lot of sense because I don't think the quartering has an alibi for where he was in January of 2002. We'll have to look into that. We'll have to contact him. We'll have to get a statement from his press secretary. But right now, I do think this story might be a little bit believable. Did I forget to mention that there was a blanket thrown over the body and that contaminated the whole crime scene? Now, can you explain the 28? page confession i really don't understand how that 28 page confession came into play so again he has a lengthy confession where he says that he and jeremy teamed up in order to commit this crime and during the course of that confession he threw the guilt on his friend jeremy again we may be talking about jeremy from the quartering i will try to confirm that later for you guys out there in the audience but the thing is is that essentially what he was doing without realizing it was admitting to felony murder. So obviously he had to backtrack from this, backtrack from this interrogation to try to get around the fact that he's already confessed to this crime, but confessed in such a way where he shifted the blame for the murder to another person. And by the way, this still doesn't explain his semen, but I guess he had a consensual encounter with her and then later decided to team up, and then this guy murdered her, and maybe for symbolic reasons, he murdered her in the spot where he had the consensual sexual encounter with her. Because like I said, when, when they were sitting there interrogating me for those six and a half hours or whatever, or however long it was, I never sat there and developed any information besides the same stuff we was going over. So do you remember telling the police that you did have sex with Krista? The only time I told the police that I had sex with Krista is when they showed me the DNA report. When they showed me the DNA report, I told them that I did have sex with Krista. So yeah, this case is ridiculous. It's absurd. It's insane. This guy is saying that he doesn't remember anything that he might have said during the course of the interrogation where he named an associate of his, Jeremy, possibly from the quartering, as the killer in this case. But he definitely, definitely, definitely didn't do it. And that's all he knows is that he didn't do it. Please ignore his confession that he also doesn't remember what he said during it. And also the police manipulated him because reasons. Now, you, you've you told your defense that the police manipulated you. What do you mean by that? Because they kept on switching everything up. You know, if I told them one thing, then they would sit here and say something totally different. And then, you know... It was just all, all crazy. It was crazy that night because I was, I was so intoxicated off of all of them drugs that I really didn't know what the hell was going on. And something, something about a blanket being thrown over the body. Did I forget to mention that a blanket being thrown over the body actually contaminates a crime scene? So all of this is null and void because remember... The crime scene was contaminated. Did I forget to talk about the blanket? Now, look, I understand the initial intrigue because you have a wealthy woman, you have an affair, you have all this stuff in the background. The police are not great at investigating homicides, so it's a lengthy process and all of that. You have some intrigue, but once they catch the guy, once the guy is this dumb, once it's that obvious that he's the killer, once you have the overwhelming evidence against him, you would think that the intrigue intrigue and the mystery and the true crime documentaries would stop but the thing is it's not just Sonny Hostin there are a bunch of stupid people that have podcasts about this case talking about it as if there is any level of mystery to this here you have a guy who confessed at one point he has given multiple different versions of events he's pointed the finger at his own associate and his story for the affair is absolutely absurd in every possible way 
The only reason that people have anything to say about this case is because it was already famous based on the initial reporting and the initial mystery. You have a story of a wealthy white woman in a wealthy white area of Massachusetts, small town that gained entry because it was like, ooh, the rich are just like us. There was a murder and it shows that they're just as petty as us. We are pulling back the veil on them to see that the horrors that exist in our day-to-day -day lives also exist in their day-to-day -day lives and it turns out no that was not the case it was somebody from without the community not from within the community and it was somebody with a working class job and it's obvious so while it could not be more obvious that chris mccowan did do he is in fact guilty we all have to suffer with the fact that he will likely at some point be released or have his sentence commuted just based on the fact that we live in a certain time in a certain context where racial politics can take over and subvert everything. So while we can all laugh at my video and you guys can be entertained by me just playing this guy's words, pointing to him and saying, yes, you're guilty, I'm sorry, but the blanket contaminating the crime scene is not this magic bullet that you think it is. In reality, Chris McGowan could be set free because this lines up perfectly with the modern racial narratives that people are trying to sell. This lines up perfectly with the desire for intrigue in true crime stories that often is superior to the desire for the truth. So even though it couldn't be more obvious, even though this guy could not be dumber, it seems like there's a chance he will be set free. I wouldn't be surprised if in a few years you'll see a commutation of this guy's case and maybe charges would actually be brought against Jeremy from the quartering. Again, no confirmation if it was Jeremy from the quartering, but where was he in January of 2002? He doesn't have an answer for that. And again, we did not reach out to him and we did not get a response. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you like this video, show me by leaving a like, subscribe for more content, follow me on all my social media, support me via the support links in the description box of this video. This has been me talking about the murder at Cape Cod and how it's not a mystery. Till next time.